They're in the kernel. Stop capsizing. The ballast tanks are empty. Should be okay. Welcome to Kermit Uncut. I'm here at the headquarters of Directors UK in Covent Garden with Ian Softley, one of my favourite filmmakers, directed Backbeat and Wings of the Dove and recently a BBC production, The Outcast. But I'm here to talk to Ian about Hackers, which astonishingly is 20 years old. Ian, I've been a champion of Hackers <laughs> since the day it opened. The anniversary is coming up. What's changed since Hackers first opened? I mean, it, well, it had a tough time at the time, but now everyone loves it. Yeah, everybody that's seen it seems to see, seems to like it. Um, I think that there was a, a difference um, in the perception of what they thought the film was going to be after Backbeat. Backbeat appeared to people who were older than the 18-year-old, 19-year-old kids in, in the film, whereas Hackers kind of straddled a couple of age groups. The characters in the film were still at school, so they were sort of 17, 18-year-olds. And for a lot of people, that wasn't hip. There weren't that many films of you know, 15, 16, 17-year-olds at the time. And I think what's happened is a lot of people who, who, who are that age embrace the film. Uh, because I'm, you know, if I'm interviewed by people who are in their 30s, they all saw the film. For those who haven't seen it, because there are still people who haven't seen Hackers, What's essentially the setup? It's about a guy called Dave Murphy, played by Johnny Lee Miller, who was uh, convicted of hacking at a young age, com a computer genius, if you like. So he has to move town, and he comes to New York, which is very strange, and he falls in with these guys who are all hackers, and hackers at the time really meant people that were interested in cyber culture, uh, as opposed to you know people that were trying to steal money from corporations. And also with a, a girl, which is Angelina Jolie's first um, movie role. There is a crime element in it where they realise when they get into an oil company's computer system that there is a crime being created in there yeah. and it's going to result in an ecological disaster. So they sort of become eco-warriors as well as internet frontiersmen. One of the things I've always really liked about the film is, I mean, I am not techno-friendly in the least bit, but I understood its story. And one of the main reasons for that is because it does a great job of moving between the physical world and the cyber world in a way which is completely organic. And you did most of that physically, didn't you? Yeah, I, w I wanted the world to sort of have a magic. Here was an opportunity to make a film about something that was about to happen. Uh, and I was excited to explore that. I wanted to kind of get inside their heads, that when you play a piece of music, you can relate to how people are getting excited. But I wanted to to somehow visualise what they were seeing as they were moving through this other parallel world. So they all lived in Manhattan, and I created this, this virtual Manhattan that was the database of the computer world they were entering, so that they were, they were having this kind of exciting journey through the streets of this virtual world. And in order to do that, I wanted it to feel as vibrant and as beautiful as possible. So I knew it had to be done physically with light and reflective objects and transparent, translucent objects. I hired a visual effects supervisor, Peter Chang, who went on to form DNEG, it's the company that works with Christopher Nolan. And rather than doing it as a computer animation, we actually created a physical world, a physical world of light and perspex in Pinewood. And it took uh, about 10 days with this motion control camera shooting frame by frame by frame and actually moving through this, this beautiful world. The film was roughly received at the time. It's now warmly loved by you know expanding group of people. Hopefully we're going to see you know, a theatrical reissue, if that's at all possible. At what point did you notice that the tide had turned and that Hackers was actually now in favour. I think there was a, a, certainly a sort of critical perception that it was kind of kind of silly in some way. I think people were expecting something kind of more serious, uh, more edgy. The film is on one level a kind of a, a fun ride, but at the same time the serious thing about it wasn't so much the plot, although we actually knew that the things that were 
in the story were possible and how a lot of them have actually come to come to pass. I think you know the people that were leading the charge of sort of uh, uh, of, of kind of poo pooing it, if you like. Um, you know, typified by the Orange County Register, which is a very conservative um, newspaper in, in, uh, in California. And they said, this film is preposterous. Everybody knows the internet is never going to be anything more than just text on a screen. <laughs> so that was a lot of the basis of people thinking, well, it was just kind of ridiculous. I think that, you know, it wasn't, we weren't trying to make high art. We were trying to make... Pop culture. Pop culture. Yeah. Well, look, I would love to see Hackers back on a big screen. I've shown it at film festivals. It's always gone down a storm. Is there a possibility that we will see it theatrically in the UK? Well, we're going we're gonna to try. There's a big Blu-ray DVD re-release in America. It actually does show regularly in cinemas. I think the last one was you know, three or four weeks ago in LA that, 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 that sold out. And you so have a 35 mil print. I've got a 35 mil print. Well, so uh, needs to you know, be shown yeah. in a cinema. Well, we'll, some way we'll at least have one maybe anniversary party screening, which you'll definitely be invited to. Well, Ian Sophie, <laughs> 20 years on, it's a great <laughs> film. It always was. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks. Kill the Gibson. Roger that. <laughs> <laughs>